Thanks, guys, again. Open up your Bible if you've got one with you. Uh, we're looking at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. As I mentioned earlier, like we're starting a new series today, The Light of the World, which you could see in the slide before the Bible reading, and um, it's going to go for three weeks. And they're all actually from John, because he picks up on this theme of the light of the world. And before I get stuck into this reading, I'm just going to apologize already for verse 13. I'm not even going to deal with that, even though we're going to read it because it ties in very well with next week. All, next week is all about that idea, so don't feel like you've been cheated. Come back next week, okay? So John chapter 1 from verse 1, and we're going to read to verse 13, and it'll be on the screen for you if you don't have a Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let's pray. Father God, one thing that's certain from the passage, and this is the bit we're not going to deal with that much today, is the fact that whenever people receive the light, and that is the man Jesus Christ, it's your doing. In and of ourselves we are people of darkness who reject the light, And so even this morning, would you do a great work among us? May we not be people of the darkness in the sense of rejecting the light. May we be open to the truth we're going to hear this morning and to invite it in, to let it expose things in us and humbly come before you. And so help us with this, Lord. Do this great work in us, we pray. May none of us leave here uh, unchanged. Will you confront us? Will you give us great joy and comfort and uh, bless our souls, we pray, for your glory and our good. Amen. Now, as you know, I've been watching a documentary on World War II, and probably some of you are sighing right now, thinking, oh my goodness, this is like the fourth time he's mentioned this in a sermon. Um, But you'll be happy to know I've finished it, okay, so it's done. Um, maybe it'll still trickle through in some sermons next year, but maybe not. But um, what I have noticed as I was finishing the series is that the three last episodes were the worst ones. They were about some of the darkest, darkest days in history, really. One was about uh, the bombing of a German town called Dresden. I don't know if you've heard about it. So the Allies dropped a ridiculous amount of bombs on this town that has pretty much been unaffected by the war to this point. And, and it pretty much turned this little town into a fire pit. They, they, they dropped a huge amount of bombs on this little town. The, the fire was so big, um, similar to, I guess, the Victorian fires a number of years ago, that the, as the flames went up, it just left these huge vacuums underneath And so as the oxygen was rushing, because you know this from school, right, that you can't have a vacuum like that, that as the oxygen rushes back to fill those vacuums, the wings would be so strong that it would blow people over, right? So this was was big. No wonder the episode was called the Dresden Firestorm. Um, You know, it was dark. It was a dark, dark episode. And you know what? It got worse. 
So the Allies planned it so that about two hours later, they did another set of bombing, more than before. And the idea was that as people who, were, who survived it came out to help others, and as the emergency services came, they would get smashed as well. Is that dark or what? Another episode was called the Liberation of Buchenwald. It was uh, when the U.S. troops first came across um, the concentration camps that were scattered throughout Germany. Uh, and the footage, you should see it, it's horrendous. It really is. It's hard to believe that any human being can treat another human being like that, that badly. There were piles of corpses lying around the place smelt like death. And the few people that were alive looked like skeletons covered in skin. It looked like some of them were days away from dying. It was so bad, the troops, when they came across this, they were so shocked, they went and asked the people, the German people that lived around these camps, if they knew about it, and all of them said, oh, we don't know what's going on. And so they forced people to walk through those camps to show them the atrocities that their government was committing, mainly towards the Jews. It was hard watching this. And I certainly, one of the things that I remember thinking as I was watching is, is the, that I never hope we have to be in a war where that is some of the consequences. And I think the other thing is it showed the depth of human wickedness that we're capable of. And it exposes how dark our hearts really are, deep down. And I say, I say our hearts intentionally. Because I think, as I've thought about this, if I'm honest with myself, given maybe a different context, is I could probably be just as bad as Hitler. All right? For some reason, God has worked it out the way that I'm not, and especially since he's intervening. But I think all of us, given the right circumstances and context, would become just as bad as him and think that we're doing a good thing and even convince other people that we're doing a good thing. And so what hope do we have of a dark world getting better? What, what resolution is there that's strong enough to pierce the human heart and change the darkest corners of our hearts, to do good, to completely turn it around? And today I want to show you the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. It has tried, but it has failed. I want to introduce you to this light. This light, if Hitler was able to invite this into his own heart, even he would be changed. So let's get stuck into it. The first thing we see about this light is that creation was made through this light. So that's in verses 1 to 5. Now, John doesn't begin his gospel or his biography about Jesus at his birth, as many of the other gospels do, right? He, he goes even further back. Not to the birth of Jesus, but he goes back to the birth of creation itself. He wants to show us that the man that we know as Jesus Christ that walked on this earth was alive long before he came to earth. And the way he shows us this is by giving us a completely new look at the story of creation. Did you notice that? As we start reading verse 1 there, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and... The oh no, sorry, that's Genesis 1. You see, that's what he wants you to do. It's meant to make you think of the first page of the Bible, the very first words of the Bible. And what we see uh, next is a few short lines that radically change how we view creation. They are mind-boggling, and, and we don't have time to do them justice. Really, we don't. Uh, we've got a theme series, and we're going to stick to the theme of light mainly. But let's just whet our appetites a bit, right? We'll just, we'll just have a little bit of a taste. Have a look then at the start. In the beginning was the Word. Uh, if you know Genesis 1, you'll think, yes, yeah, 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 I remember that. The Word was there, God's Word, right? Uh, and, you know, it, 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 it had this constant refrain, remember? God said, God said, God said. And so His Word was there. It's repeated many times. God's Word dictates and it dominates Genesis 1. But look, at the, but look at the next bit. So we're just going to go through this a little bit, and the whole sermon's not going to be like that. Let's follow the logic of John. Look at the next bit. And the Word was with God. Now, this is getting interesting. So the Word was God's Word, but it was with God. In other words, 
the Word was distinct and separate from God. And, and this Word of God, like it's often done in the Old Testament, is personified and given kind of almost its own identity, but here it's going to a whole nother level. It's awesome. So let's keep reading. And the Word was God. Okay, so the Word wasn't distinct from God and, you know, part of creation. No, no, no. The Word was distinct from God, but was God. Okay, that is what we see. Here we can see the one God of the Old Testament is maybe more complex than we've thought before. Actually, when I was reading this, I was thinking of shortly after I got converted, I was sitting with Josh McMahon in a little church down in Coburn. At about 1 a.m. we finished, and he was trying to wrap my head around the fact that Jesus didn't just begin living when he was born here, that he was, and this is what we see here. Here we see that the one God of the Old Testament is more complex than we thought. This was certainly the case for me. We've known God is a complex being, though, isn't it? Like, we've had hints of it. Have a look here at Genesis 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. You see, here you can all of a sudden see there's God, and then there's the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. And now that we've read this bit of John, we, can, we know that the Word was there too. And so you've got one God in three persons. They're all equally God, but they're distinct from one another. Okay, that's what we see. Let's keep reading. He was in the beginning with God. Oh, okay, okay, I see. So the word here is a he. It's not an it. Okay, so he's a person. He's not a thing or a force or some flame or whatever. You know, he's not some impersonal creative power like some religions believe that help create the universe. No, he's a person. In other words, he, he, he thinks and he speaks, he, he feels, he can reason, he has a character. You know, very similar to us, right? But obviously in a league of his own, because I can't say this about myself. And you know what? In fact, we were made in his likeness. He's not like us. We are like him. Let's keep reading. We're on to verse 3 now. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So everything that was made at creation was made through the Word. That, that kind of makes sense, right? Because as we've said already from Genesis 1, whenever God spoke, something happened. And so He created everything through His Word, the Word. It's remarkable, isn't it? There's nothing that was made at creation that wasn't made through the Word. Nothing. Nothing. I mean, how is that even possible, right? And, and the answer is in verse 4. Have a look at verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So the Word has life within himself. That's how he could make all things, and every single thing that has life in itself got that life from Jesus, this this word. This is so radically different from us, isn't it? We don't have life within ourselves. And what I mean is we, we can't choose when we want to be alive. You know, like we can't uh, choose to give someone else life either. None of us are alive because we chose to be alive. Have you thought about that? You didn't become alive because you desired it. You became alive because the Word desired it. When He gave you life from within Himself. Only He can do that. We can't do that. Uh, I've heard of people talking of, of the horrible experience of um, touching a loved one that's passed away. And one thing that they often say is how cold they felt. Just almost that there's, it's this lifeless body. There's no life running through their veins. And no matter how hard you try, you and I cannot put life in them again. That's the sad reality when we stand in those situations. 
Only the Word can, this Word that we're reading about here. He brings us into existence and He takes us out of it. Our days are completely in His hands, right? Completely. It's astonishing, isn't it? The Word has life within Himself and it booms out of Him like light. It's a a bit like the sun, right? And we've experienced this again with the arrival of summer, even though it doesn't seem like that today. Um, But you know, once it heats up and the sun is out for much longer than what it was in wintertime, you you, you have life just happens, right? So all the plants seem to be growing. They all have new buds. They, They produce beautiful flowers. You've got new baby animals being born in your backyard, flying out of trees and stuff. We had that happen. Um, And, you know, they're all up much earlier in the morning, and they wake you up as well sometimes. But we're all up earlier, aren't we? Like, we're up and we're out and about. We're at the beach or we're working out to try and get rid of all that weight we've put on on during the winter. Or is that just me? Um, But, you know, with the light comes life. And it's the same with the Word. You cannot separate the life and the light that radiates from this Word. It's, and it's so powerful, nothing can stop it. As it says there, the darkness cannot overcome it. It's so important, in fact, that John now only talks about the light from here on in, at least in our little introduction section, and hence our series, and hence that point, creation through the light. Now, let's play a game, all right? Are you ready? I want us to imagine something, okay? Are you ready? Now imagine, we've, after everything that we've just seen in this first point about the light, imagine he comes to earth, right? Now, it's a, you've got to have a good imagination here, but imagine that. Imagine that with me. What would he be like uh, if this personal, powerful light that is God, through whom everything was made, came to earth, what would he be like? Well, I reckon he, would, he wouldn't talk like Moses, or Muhammad, you know, they often say, like, God said this, and God said that, and God, uh, God, God, God. I reckon he would say something like, hey, you've heard it was said, but I tell you, or maybe he'll say things like, truly, truly, I tell you. I I can imagine him doing that. Uh, He would probably have power over creation, you know, because he's the creator. So he'd probably be able to still the winds and calm the waves He'd probably be able to take like a handful of fish and just multiply it and feed thousands of people. Or he would probably be able to look at a guy that's struggling to get fish out of a boat and he says, hey, just throw your net out on the other side. And it just sounds ridiculous and fills it up with fish. Do you you reckon that could be what would happen? He would probably be able to give people life from within himself. You know, he'd probably be able to raise a little girl, I think, you know, who's passed away where the dad thought it was too early. He'd probably be able to raise a widow's only son so that he can care for her and love her and help her in her loneliness. He'd probably be able to shout something, let's make a name up, right? Lazarus, come out! And Lazarus would come out. Friends, you can see what I'm doing, right? I'm being cheeky. I'm showing you Jesus is the light through whom through whom everything was created. And that's what John would want you to see as well if you continue to read his gospel. Okay, but we're not going to read it all, not today at least. And this is what makes Christmas so wonderful. It makes it so special. It's not simply the birth of a baby. It's the God of creation stepping into his creation and becoming part of it. It's huge. There's no other religion like ours. No other God has done that. But let's not jump ahead too quickly, okay? This is part of a series. Let's look on to the next point. So creation through the light's our first one. And then we see in the next section, witness about the light from verses 6 to 9. Now, have you ever shouted at someone? I mean, I'm not encouraging shouting at people, but on the odd occasion, have you ever shouted something like, Heads! Yeah, something like that, or maybe watch out. I think most of us have probably been hit at some point, um, you know, by a cricket ball or a footy or some flying object coming through the air. And, and normally when you see one of these things flying, right, and someone's in the way of it, you shout, heads! 
And um, you're doing it because you love them, right? If you didn't care, you'd just like sit and watch them get hit and laugh at them evilly. Um, But you do it because you care for them, don't you? You want them to protect their head or, or run away or somehow not get hurt. Now, the remarkable truth that we see in this section is that the light of creation we looked at under point one is heading towards planet Earth. He's heading for us. He's, he was coming into the world. Look at verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And you know what? God didn't want us to miss it. He didn't want us to miss it. That was, was so wonderful. And so he sent this man called John to tell us that the light was coming. It was a bit like God's heads, you know, to the world, to warn us. Have a look from from verse 6. There was a man sent from God. Notice it's from God. This is God's doing. He's very kind to do this to us. His name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. I, I guess my illustration of John being called God's heads, you know, it's not quite... Fair, it's probably a little bit wrong, and that's because God doesn't want us to run from this light that's coming at us. Um, maybe John's ministry is more like a wedding invitation, right, that's, that's warning you of a future event that, that the, whoever's inviting you to, um, they don't want you to miss it. Maybe it's a bit more like that. Now, what I want you to see in this second point is just how kind and gracious God it was to send both John and Jesus, okay? We'll start with John. You know, he didn't have to send John, but he did. And he did it because he loves us. He loves us. He didn't want us to miss Jesus coming into the world, the one that can give us light and life. Um, It says there that Jesus, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. You see, Jesus is the only one that can enlighten us, okay, if you, if you want to put it that way. Every single person that turns from darkness to the light can only do it through Jesus. There's no other way. He's the only way we can see who we truly are. He's the only way we can truly see who God is. And He's the only, way that, he's the only person that can show us what the world really is like. And so to miss Jesus, the light, would be to miss true life altogether. And so God, God doesn't want that for us. And He's so kind in warning us of Jesus' coming. He doesn't want us to remain in darkness and death and continue to experience things like World War II. No, He wants us to accept the light and to have life. Now, if you, if you think about this, if John's... If John's ministry shows God's grace and kindness towards us, how much more Jesus, right? I mean, you have to remember that when it says that the light came into the world, it wasn't the world that Jesus originally had created. When John talks about the world, it doesn't simply mean the earth either. Hey, this, you know, thing that looks flat but is round and has stuff growing on it. Neither is it the world we looked at at point one, where where it's bigger than this planet, but it was freshly created. No, when John talks about the world throughout his gospel, generally speaking, he means a fallen creation, a fallen world. And so the world in, in John's gospel tends to represent a place and especially a people, the human race, that's that's in rebellion against God. This is true. Is it not? I mean, think about it. Our world is against God and wanting to do the opposite of what He wants for us. Even if we think back, right, if we just stick to point one, okay, instead of looking at everything that God wants for us, if we just look at point one, let's have a quick think about how many people in our world believes what we saw there. How many people believe God created the world? How many people believe Jesus is the one who has given them life and continues to sustain them and uphold them? How many people believe we are made like this personal God of John 1? 
<laughs> Not a lot, is there? Our world doesn't believe there was life in Jesus himself. And then everything else came about. No, 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 no. They believe there was matter. And then somehow, out of all of that, came life. Our world has rejected its creator. We have walked away from the light that is giving us life. And we have embraced the darkness. No wonder we have the events of World War II, right? No wonder we experience so much darkness and death and hurt. And, and, and even a bit closer to home, if we're honest, no wonder we see so much darkness in ourselves. Let's not fool ourselves. Let's not talk about Hitler and people out there. Even in ourselves. And so how gracious is God to send the light into a world like that? How awesome is Jesus to come into the darkness that's rejected him? This is what makes Christmas so tremendously, ridiculously, and astonishingly good, right? The God of creation comes to his creation even though they hated him and they rejected him, and he wants to love it. He wants to love it. He wants to love us. And so that's our second point. Witness about the light, John the Baptist, and how gracious God is in that. So creation through the light, witness about the light, and then third and finally, you and the light. And we look, see this in verses 10 to 13. So what we see is that Christmas is a reminder again that Jesus came into the world as the light of life. And we've got two ways to respond to him. And these two ways uh, are put for us there in the last four verses of our passage. So let's start with the first response in verses 10 to 11. Read it with me. He, so there's talking about Jesus, the light, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. So Jesus didn't just plan to come to earth and sent this guy called John uh, to warn people. It actually ended up happening. <laughs> The plan became reality. Jesus was a human being that lived on this planet. Not just the Bible teaches us that, but historians even of that time has Jesus splattered throughout their works. Jesus was in this world, he, the one he created, and yet the world didn't know him. Now when it says that the world didn't know him, um, it is talking about more than just knowing about him, right? So like the historian that knew about Jesus, it's talking about more than that. Knowing Jesus is about having an intimate relationship with him. It's about receiving him into your life. It's, it's about letting what he says dictate what you say and, and hearing what he desires and letting that shape you. It's about talking to him. It's about loving him. It's about holding him as precious in your life. It's about growing in your understanding of him and so on and so on. It's a bit like two people getting married, right? All those things should happen in a marriage. And that idea of uh, knowing someone is often used in the Old Testament when two people get married and they have an intimate relationship uh, that results in children. So when you think that, that Jesus is the one that, that made you, that gave you life, that sustained you and pursued you even by coming to earth, responding to him by having this intimate relationship would be very appropriate, I think, don't you think? But that's not what our world does. It doesn't want to know him. It doesn't want to know Jesus. The darkness rejects the light instead of embracing it and accepting it. You know, even the Jewish people that you, th you would have thought should know better the people from whom Jesus came, he was birthed out of there, um, and had a, they had a special relationship with God, even they did not receive him. And, and that's our first option in response to Jesus. You don't receive him, you reject him, and you continue to live in darkness. And there will be a little bit more about that next week. The second response, which is the one that I'm going to encourage you to do, <laughs> and it's a way better, is found in verses 12 to 13. 
Have a read of it with me. Verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So the second response is not to reject Jesus, but to receive him. It's to welcome the light instead of hiding from it. And this receiving is not just receiving Jesus as a person. You know, like as, as people, generally, we, we receive people and, 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 and we tend to hang out with people we like. So it's a personable thing. But with Jesus, it's more than just receiving him as a person, even though that's part of it. It's also about receiving what he's done for you. And that's where lots of people find Christianity tricky, right? They just think, no, no, I don't need Jesus to do anything for me. I've got this covered. That's what it means to believe in Jesus' name, not just to accept him who he is, but what he has done for you. And and Jesus' name, I'm sure you know this, you've heard this a million times, it's not just about his name, Jesus, is it? His name is his reputation. It's, it's, It's a reputation that he's built for himself based on what he's done. And would you believe it, out of everything that Jesus did, people that love him have crosses that symbolizes their love for him because that's where he made a reputation for himself is on the cross he made a name for himself by dying on the cross have you thought about that because i don't know if you know but back in jesus day as he was crucified the romans had kind of um just perfected the art of crucifixion and <laughs> thousands of people were getting crucified so why are we talking about this guy jesus who were killed like that. And I'll give you three quick reasons that tie in with what we've seen already here today. The first reason is that Jesus gave up his life. It wasn't taken from him. Have you thought about that? He gave up his life. It wasn't taken from him. I mean, we've just seen that Jesus, from eternity past, has had life within himself. He's got it within him. He's upholding every single created thing that has life in it. And so how, how can he die if he has life within himself? With us, our life can be taken from us, right? Why, how does this work with him? Because he gave up his life. It wasn't taken from him. How, look how Jesus puts it a bit later in John, John 10, 17. For this reason, the Father loves me, Jesus says, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. You know what? No man that ever died on a cross died willingly, except for Jesus. He willingly died on the cross. The light of life, dead, because he gave it up. The second, so that's, I think there's a pretty good reason to make a name for yourself dying on the cross. The second reason ties in with the first, but it's different, okay? It's the fact that Jesus kept silent most of the time. From his arrest, right to when he breathed his last, he was actually quite quiet. Um, It's it's quite interesting, I mean, no, actually, I won't go there. But think of the power of Jesus' words, right? He created everything uh, uh, when he speaks, dead people are raised, he calms storms, he, he, he gets rid of demons. They're powerful. And so whatever he wants, he can just speak it and it'll happen, right? But he holds back during this time. Look how, how Isaiah put it. Many years before Jesus even came to earth, he said, um, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So the reality is Jesus kept silent. You know what's interesting? When you look at all these histories, people did not keep silent. They were insulting people. They were spitting on people. It was like, hey, I'm going to die now anyway. I'm going to just give it to everyone. But not Jesus. The third reason and final reason why Jesus' death on the cross is so famous is because it was a dark day. It was a dark day. I started the sermon talking about some dark days, but none of them compared to Jesus' death. As horrible as those things were, 
I mean, what can get darker than creatures killing their creator? What can get darker than sinners killing the sinless and perfect God? What can get darker than mortals killing the immortal God? What can get darker than humans shouting words of hate and death towards the person that's upholding their lives by his life-giving word? It's pretty dark for those reasons alone. But it was also literally dark, so God can show us that something even bigger was going on. You know, for about six hours before Jesus breathed his last breath, darkness covered the land. Jesus was taking our darkness upon himself, and he was copying the punishment that we deserve. This all of a sudden explains the silence, doesn't it? It explains the injustice. It explains why he gave up his life and it wasn't taken from him. He was swapping places with us because he loves us so much. You know what you get if you believe in Jesus in his work on the cross? Have Have a look there at the end of verse 12. There's not much better that you're ever going to read in your life. You are given the right to become a child of God. Oh my goodness. Surely that trumps every other single right that you have, don't you think? It's better than, I looked at the UN Nations, uh, United Nations, um, they've got this bill of human rights. This is better than your right to live. It's better than your right to liberty. It's better than your right to free speech. You know, you can have the right to be a child of the living God freely given to you by Jesus. It's amazing. And what what baffles me, right, is that most people think that they will go to heaven. They think that somehow they have the right to just go to heaven, right? I don't know who they think they are. You know, like, they have less right to enter heaven than the stranger just has a right to just walk into my house. I won't tolerate that. In fact, in some countries, you will get shot if you trespass. Now, now, do you think you'll just waltz into God's place? The holy and pure living God? No, 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 no. It's a right that's reserved only for the children of God. And it's a right that only Jesus can give us. So friends, when it comes to you and the light... Have you received him? Have you let the true light in to your heart? And do you let it continue to expose you daily? Do you believe in his work in your place? Can you see how he did it for you? Gave himself up for you? Withhold himself from speaking for you? Can you see how he's done it for you? Make sure... You have the right to be a child of God before you walk out of these doors today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you offer us the right to be your children. Us, a dark and wicked people that have rejected you, the one that's given us life, that created us, that planned us from the, before the foundations of the world. We've rejected you. We hated you. And as we'll see next week, we, we don't just live in the darkness, but we love the darkness. And yet you've broken in. This is your work. As we see that we are born by you and you alone, and you have graciously opened up our eyes to see the truth about Jesus and to embrace him and to receive him and to love him and to have the right to be your children. What a beautiful right that is. May we cling to it. May we treasure it. And above all, we thank you for it, Lord. May we share it with others. They've got many rights on this planet, but there's nothing that trumps this right. So help us to share it. It's a free gift. That's why we give gifts on Christmas, because you have freely given us the right to be children of yourself. And so may we think about that this Christmas and we thank you again.
in Jesus' name. Amen.